afternoon and welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. I'm George Hidalgo, Club President. Thanks for joining us. We'll start today's meeting with Elaine Mishler playing My Country, Tis of Thee. some additional special music today which was a joint effort. Leading in the song, Build Me Up Buttercup is Dick Lovell with backup singers his wife Cindy Lovell and their daughter Sarah Joy Lovell. Now Jeff Bartell is at the keyboard with video production by Jeff's son Nicholas Bartell. Let's listen. Why do you build me up, build me up. buttercup, baby, then to let me down, let me down. mess me around, and then worst of, all, worst of all, you never come, baby, when you say you will, say you will. but I love you still, I need, you. I need you, more than anyone, darling, you know that I have from the start, so build me up, build me up. buttercup, don't break my heart. I'll be over at ten, you tell me time and again, but you're late. I wait around and then, I went to the door, I can't wait anymore. It's not you, you let me down again. Baby, baby, try to find hey, hey, hey. a little time and I'll make you mine. Hey, hey, hey. I'll be home, I'll be beside the phone waiting for you. You build me up, buttercup, baby, then you let me down. You mess me around, and then worst of all, you never call, baby, when you say you will. But I love you still, I need you more than anyone, darling. You know that I have from the start. So build me up, buttercup, don't break my heart. Each year, in addition to the nearly $675,000 we provide in financial support to our community and beyond, we also have the Community Projects Committee that helps connect Rotarians and their families to the hands-on community service activities. In the past year, we had nearly 100 members provide hands-on volunteer service to our community. There's one member in particular I'd like to single out for recognition today. Martha Sullivan is a partner of Honkamp, Kruger, and company, a CPA and business consultants firm in Wanakee. She joined our Rotary Club in 2016 and is the past chair of our Community Projects Committee. Martha likes to sew, so when she was asked to help make face masks for local nonprofits in need of them, she stepped up to help out. Now Martha made over 300 masks for Porchlight, 100 for a Grace, as well as some for River Food Pantry the Goodman Community Center, and 15 for Rotarians who asked for one. Martha has sewn and donated over 530 face masks. This is an incredible service, and when you see Martha, thank her for the time she took out of her busy schedule to help people in need in our community during the pandemic. Martha exemplifies what it means to be a Rotarian. Thanks, Martha. So we have an announcement. I heard about an idea you several years ago where a new member of our club interviewed a longer term member. This sounded like a great idea and is a great fit within our connect, grow, and serve value proposition. So I asked Alice and Tanya to help me coordinate this effort and we will start with featuring one of these interviews each month. Let me know what you think and we may try to get more of them into the schedule if you like them. This month, Alex and Tanya interviewed longtime Rotarian, 
Juan Jose Lopez. And then Alex is going to give us a summary of their interview. Alex is originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and received his bachelor's and master's degree in business administration and sports administration from Ohio State University. So please, don't hold that against him. So he moved to Madison, Wisconsin in 2017 to become the business development manager for Badger Sports Property, and that is the same year he joined our Rotary Club. Alex is listed among in businesses 40 under 40 class of 2020. Let's welcome Alex to the podium. Hello, my fellow Rotarians. Alex Vitani here with our uh, first installment of our member interview series as part of our Connect, Grow, and Serve platform. Uh, we'll be introducing or reintroducing in some cases some members that you may not know uh, a lot about, uh, but that have done really awesome things in our Rotary Club uh, that we wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to get to know a little bit better. Um, so today I'll be sharing uh, Juan Jose Lopez's story and I uh, really enjoyed my conversation with Juan Jose. Uh, Juan Jose is a San Antonio, Texas native uh, and so we quickly bonded over our time in Texas. I lived in San Antonio for a couple of years working for uh, the Spurs. Uh, we're both big Spurs fans so go Spurs go Juan Jose uh, and if you haven't had a chance to meet Juan Jose he does prefer Juan Jose uh, as Juan's a pretty common name in San Antonio, so uh, he likes to take the extra uh, step there of giving you Juan Jose. Um, so Juan Jose will tell you that he came to Madison via uh, Republic and American Airlines in the 1970s. Uh, but what really brought him here uh, were his academic pursuits at UW-Madison. Um, now, fucking conventional Wisconsin wisdom, Juan uh, actually embraced the cold and wanted to get out of the heat, uh, and hence why he uh, came here to Madison and quickly fell in love with the university. Uh, and as he says, he will die a badger and on Wisconsin. So uh, I can certainly appreciate that. Uh, Juan, Juan Jose's studies at UW-Madison focused on social work and sociology, um, but those are really just providing academic support to his real passion, um, which is helping others, especially the youth in our community. Um, Juan Jose's got an illustrious resume, uh, so I'll just hit a couple of high points here, but I uh, worked with Briar Patch, uh, Centro Hispano, the Department of Workforce Development, and also a time as the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, but when I asked him what his uh, most rewarding career achievement was or what he enjoyed the most about what he did professionally, um, what he said uh, was his most rewarding were his uh, time on the Madison Board of Education and the one-to-one -one mentorship relationships that he established with, uh, with youth uh, in our community. Um, and he actually shared several of his mentees who now grown up. Uh, and gone on to become quite successful in their own right, including some uh, that have been elected to political offices to uh, serve our community, which is great. So kind of keeping the cycle going. Uh, Juan Jose did retire in 2019, so congratulations there. Uh, and he's enjoying the fruits of his labor and remains active uh, in the Madison area just in different ways. On the Rotary front, uh, Juan Jose's story begins in 1996 when he was with Project Opportunity. Leaders of several partner organizations of Project Opportunity encouraged him uh, to join Rotary, um, like so many of us join, uh, to meet others with a community first mindset uh, and to enhance our professional profile. Um, he had some really great stories. Uh, two of the my favorites that Juan Jose shared about his time in Rotary uh, were when he got to meet Badgers coach Barry Alvarez, uh, when Coach Alvarez first started. Uh, so Juan Jose approached Barry after a Rotary, uh, I believe he spoke at a lunch at what he mentioned. Um, and asked him to speak at Centro Hispano's inaugural banquet coming up, uh, which Coach obliged, so uh, that was awesome. But then when Coach asked him what should he talk about, because Barry was new to town, um, wasn't too connected with the community yet at that point, uh, Juan Jose replied, football coach, people love football, <laughs> which I thought was fitting uh, given uh, the football craze fans that we have here in Madison. Uh, he also shared an interesting story of running into a fellow Rotarian professor, Michael Petrovich, who uh, was a professor at the UW. Um, and what Juan Jose shared was that years earlier, Professor Petrovich uh, was an advisor for a student organization um, that Juan Jose belonged to that may have protested a time or two. Um, nothing crazy, but, uh, you know, just, you know, was out and about making, uh, making some, some waves here uh, in the campus community. Uh, when they bumped into each other at Rotary, uh, Professor Petrovich said to Juan Jose, uh, so you've joined the establishment now, uh, which I thought uh, was funny. Uh, Juan Jose got a kick out of it as well. But um, in thinking about Juan Jose's story and that establishment that, that he joined, um, we should all feel fortunate to be a part of this establishment as well, be part of the downtown uh, Rotary Club. Um, 
you know, Juan, shared, Juan Jose shared that we're blessed to make lifelong relationships, gain valuable um, professional experiences, and also change the lives of those in our community. And some of the things he's most proud of are our scholarship programs and our community service initiatives, which, which help make Madison a better place to live. Um, he encourages all of you to develop relationships with Rotarians from all walks of life uh, and to live out the Rotary values every day. Uh, he's a proud Rotarian, and he shared that when the day comes, he's going to make sure that the, his Rotary experience is noted on his obituary. Uh, and of course, that'll be followed by a hearty on Wisconsin. Uh, enjoyed my time with Juan Jose. If you have a chance to meet him or bump into him, I encourage it. Um, great man, uh, really awesome person to know, and, uh, and hopefully uh, somebody that will be seeing around Rotary for many years. Thanks for that interview, Alex and Juan, and I hope you all enjoyed it. I'll call on Alex Fatanye once more. Alex is also chairing our Rotaract Advisory Committee this year, so he's now going to make a quick announcement about his role with the Rotaract Group on the UW Madison campus. Alex? Hello, my fellow Rotarians. Alex Vitani from Badger Sports Properties. Um, and before I uh, get into what I want to share with you all today. I thought I'd start with a, uh, a brief story uh, and a couple of visuals. Uh, so this is me here. I'm the goofy kid in the big thick glasses and the bowl cut uh, and the only one not wearing the yellow team issued pants for my uh, sixth grade or I'm sorry, six year old little league baseball team. Uh, we made it to the championship game that year and that's the closest I have ever come uh, to winning a championship for a team that I've played on or worked for. Um, but I share the story because at that point in my life, I wanted to grow up to be a professional uh, baseball player or a professional football player or basketball or whatever it may have been. Um, my athletic prowess tapped out uh, or topped out in the seventh grade, and I quickly realized that that wasn't going to be a career path for me. So uh, as I matriculated through school and became interested in different careers, um, I eventually settled on uh, working in sports. And I wanted to tie this back into Rotary because one of my first mentors working in sports was a gentleman by the name of Dave Palmer. And he worked at the local radio station or owned the local radio station that uh, the summer league baseball team that I, uh, that I ran uh, during a couple of summers in my college town uh, were airing our games on. Um, Dave was a Rotarian in Athens, Ohio, and he brought me to my very first Rotary meeting to do a presentation uh, to the Rotary Club in Athens uh, about what we were doing with our baseball team. That was a room of about 30 people, so a little uh, less intimidating for me now than it was then, but still being a 22-year-old uh, kid in front of uh, movers and shakers of a town was, uh, was pretty impressive. But I remember that meeting because that was my first experience with Rotary, uh, and I grew from this having hopes and dreams of playing sports to my career now of working in sports. And so you may be wondering, okay, Alex, what a, where do we come in? Well, uh, this year I'll be the chair of the Rotaract Advisory Committee, helping the students in the Rotaract Club at UW-Madison uh, pursue their passions and their dreams. And we need your help. Uh, the Rotaract Club, uh, the students are beginning to plan their year of content and they're looking for Rotarians to share their stories. Uh, and this year is gonna be obviously pretty unique but I think one that provides a lot of unique opportunity for us to give back to the future leaders of our business, uh, business world, our community, and of course, uh, our Rotary Club. Um, they'll be doing, hopefully, their usual in-person meetings, um, but then also are looking at ways to do pre-recorded sessions or live video sessions uh, that they can then share with their membership. And they gave me a couple of uh, topic areas that we are hoping that some of our members in our audience uh, here today can help um, them fill. So, they're really interested in hearing from Rotarians uh, with the following career uh, and subject matters. Uh, in addition, if you have just a great story to tell. So uh, if you have a background in economics, uh, creative, fine arts, if you're a chef or have any other artistic avenues, um, sports and entertainment industries, uh, work in the fields of strategic communications or journalism, or are a leader uh, or an expert or, have, or run a business that deals with marketing and digital communications, those are all topics that they are interested in uh, learning about. Um, so I want to leave you with a quick stat and then a call to action. Uh, per Scientific American, if you are like most people, you might be your favorite subject of conversation. In fact, uh, average person spends 60% of our conversations talking about themselves because it makes us feel good. So I see this as an opportunity to not only make ourselves as Rotarians feel good by talking about ourselves, but to do good by uh, helping the future leaders of our society 
uh, figure out their hopes and dreams and careers and find mentors like I was so lucky uh, to have, have had happen uh, with Dave Palmer at the Athens Rotary Club. So if you're interested in joining our committee or being a speaker or a presenter for the Rotaract Club, please contact the office and they can get you in touch with me. And we hope that we'll be seeing you involved with the Rotaract Club uh, here this year. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Let's go on to birthdays. We have birthdays to celebrate with a bit of humor or wisdom that complements Rotary's mission. We also encourage members to make an age-appropriate gift to the Madison Rotary Foundation, rounded up to 100 for our club's Synergy Scholarship Fund. So our first birthday on July 21st is Tina Scholes. July 21st, Scott Homerson. Also July 21st, past president, Dave Mollenhoff. July 24th, Jackson Fonder. July 24th, Lynn Sexton. July 25th, past president, Roth Judd. Thanks to our celebrants for their contributions to the Madison Rotary Foundation. Please join me in wishing them a happy birthday. Thanks to Pat Gutenberg for playing happy birthday to our birthday members today. Okay, on to our program. Our speaker today is Professor Jeremy Suri, who holds the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, and is a professor at the university's Department of History and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. He is the author and editor of several books on contemporary politics and foreign policy, and writes for various online sites and blogs. He is a popular public lecturer and he appears frequently on radio and television programs. Smithsonian Magazine named him one of America's top young innovators in the arts and sciences. Jeremy has spoken to our club on five previous occasions. His presentation to us today is titled American Democracy During the COVID-19 Crisis, Political Participation Among Next Generation. Let's welcome Professor Jeremy Surrey to our virtual podium. Hello, downtown Rotary in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, this is Jeremy Suri. I'm delighted to be joining you by video and soon live Q&A after our session today. Um, and it's really a joy to be with you. It's about 100 degrees in Austin today. And I wish I were in Madison to be with all of you. Uh, our family thinks very longingly about our time in Madison. We love Austin, Texas, but uh, there is no substitute for Madison, uh, Wisconsin. And I speak to many, many, many groups, and there really isn't any substitute for downtown Rotary. Uh, the enthusiasm, the energy you bring, and the fact you're continuing to do this uh, online during this difficult COVID moment is very impressive. I'm, I'm honored to be with you. I want to thank Jane uh, from the Rotary office. I want to thank Ron Luskin and many of my other friends for making my uh, visit to you today uh, possible. What I want to talk about is how our society should think about history in light of the many challenges we face today. We're going through a major transformation in our democracy, a transformation that's filled with obvious crises, suffering, difficulties, uh, but it's also a transformation, I'm going to argue historically, that matches with our experiences of the past and that opens many possibilities for us. As many of you know, I'm a historian and I'm also an optimist. I believe that studying the past allows us to see new opportunities in the present. In fact, those who want to keep us in crisis are trying to get us not to study our history, keeping up old statues and not talking about what they mean and why our society has changed and why those statues should change. That is actually ahistorical. To want to preserve things as they've always been and to tell us we can't imagine a different world, that's the ahistorical position. We are today confronting major changes and an opportunity to use our history to re-examine who we are and to rethink how we go forward. And that's what I wanna talk about today in the context of political partisanship, in the context of the crisis we're in, and looking forward to where I think this history tells us we might be going. 
And the best way to do this is not simply to talk about history, but to read poetry. Poetry captures the feelings that are so deep within us, and it puts those feelings into words. And we know as historians that feelings drive action more than rational decision-making. We are feeling-sensitive actors as human beings. In moments of crises, we are drawn, drawn together in certain ways, drawn apart in other ways, and poetry captures so much of, of who we are. Those of you who listen to our podcast, This is Democracy, which is every week we talk about these issues, knows that we begin every session there with poetry, and I thought we'd do that today as well. And uh, we have our poet here, my son, Zachary Siri. I hope you all remember. Uh, Zachary, you want to say hello, Zachary? I'll get out of your way. Hello. Zachary's going to read his poem uh, to you today that he, that he has written just for this lecture. This is a poem for Downtown Rotary, Zachary's Ode to Downtown Rotary. It's entitled, I Remember When I Was Four. I remember when I was four, we walked into a voting booth on a dusty gymnasium floor before I'd even lost a tooth. I watched my father cast his vote for a black man in Grant Park in an overcoat. And vaguely, I remember like folklore, the park and his hopeful truth, like something good was in store. I remember it like a haze, sweet, like democratic vermouth, that someone on their deathbed after the will they just wrote opens, caches their promissory note. And I remember a different place and a different time that on a Tuesday was filled with rain and lights flashed from the highway as if out of an old rhyme on signs that bore my mother's name, stuck in grass between the pavement stone, glowing as the raindrops shone. That same night, I watched the unfolding crime, the old adage of the tyrant's stain, and tasted fear's bitter lime, wanting to cry as if something had been slain, remembering the gymnasium alone, trying to find some logic in this collective groan. And then we saw a man dying for eight minutes on a street in front of a squad car, and some of us, we found ourselves staring up at a star, knowing we'd end up rewriting this in some future national memoir. Say a little bit before you move, Zachary, about what, uh, what your poem's about. My poem is really about this memory I have of when I went to vote for Barack Obama with my dad in Madison, Wisconsin, what that means to me, but also how important it is that young people who have lived through all these moments in American history get involved in politics and, and do something for change. Great. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have the family I have, and, and uh, especially a, a poet son in Zachary Suri, uh, precocious at, at age 15 in his poetry and his insights. Uh, what Zachary's getting at in this poem is not simply the promise of the election of Barack Obama in the past, the promise of change today, and the despair of seeing the difficulties we have as Democrats and Republicans, as independents, uh, understanding change in our world today. What Zachary is also getting at is the partisanship in our society. And my first point for today is that partisanship is actually nothing new. We, we, we're shocked that wearing a mask uh, has become a partisan statement. We're shocked that going to school has become a partisan statement. But in fact, these are old partisan positions, old partisan points of view, how you dress, what safety should mean in our society, who should go to school when, these have long been hotly contested issues. As many historians have argued, partisanship is built into the American political system. We are taught as students that actually George Washington did not want parties, it is true, but he was in fact the outlier. Our system has been partisan from the very beginning for two important reasons. First of all, we are a large, diverse society with very different regions, and moving from Wisconsin to Texas, one knows that. Very different regional point of views, very different ethnic point of views, very different religious point of views, very different economic point of view, points of view. And those differences have allied with party cleavages. And what parties have done since the 19th, the early 19th century in American society, is that they have motivated people, often emotionally, often by feelings, often by what some would call the poetry of politics, which can often be quite ugly. They have motivated people to identify with one party or another. In the early republic, it is Democrat, Republicans, and Whigs. By the mid-19th century, you have a series of other parties, including the Know Nothing 
Party, the anti-immigrant party, that in some ways becomes the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln. And we even have a progressive party in the early 20th century. Many of those in Wisconsin remember and know the La Follette family, which was Republican, but also progressive in many ways. Parties have been the cleavages of American society. When Alexis de Tocqueville came to our society, he was struck by the ways in which Americans grouped themselves. They grouped themselves in different churches, in different workplaces, and they grouped themselves by party. And built into our system of partisanship is a devolution to two large parties not because people within those parties always agree. In fact, the parties are coalitions of different sub parties. You could argue the Republican party today is actually three parties in one. You could argue the Democratic party today is probably 15 parties in one. These different sub cleavages become larger parties because of our winner take all system. One of the most defining elements and for, in some eyes, one of the most damaging elements of American politics is the presence in our system of a winner-take-all phenomenon, which is to say that if you run for office and you do not get a majority, you do not get anything. So you can have six parties. Uh, they can come close to winning uh, in a state, but they get nothing. The party that either gets the majority or in some cases the plurality is actually the party that wins in the state. So you don't always need a majority. It depends on the kind of election you're holding. In Austin, Texas, the mayoral election, the city council elections, you need a majority. When running for president, you need the plurality in your state to get the electoral votes from that state. But the point here is that with few exceptions, with very few exceptions, Winning is getting everything. If you have the plurality or majority of votes, you are actually getting all of what comes with that, which leads things to make it difficult for small parties to survive in American society. This is the question I'm often asked. Why don't we have smaller parties when most people are upset with the two large parties? It's because you cannot get anywhere as a small party. The best way to win influence is to be a small party within a big party and influence that big party's activities. And so the partisan devolution has been structured into American society and the devolution toward two parties in particular has been with us from the very start. Our media has always been built around that. This is a really important point. The growth of the American media was around parties. Parties supported newspapers, Parties supported the circulation of those newspapers, and parties printed and promoted their own news. So the prevalence of fake news is a 19th century phenomenon. It's as much a Jacksonian phenomenon as it is a phenomenon today. This point about partisanship is really important because it is built into our system, and we should not expect nor be surprised when we see it even during a moment of pandemic, even during a moment of racial strife, to see partisanship so strong actually is actually what, we should, what we should expect within our society. Traditionally, by the way, parties have not only financed candidates, parties have not only been responsible for getting votes, they have actually brought people to the voting place. And partisanship is often what leads people to vote. Americans quite traditionally don't know much about the people they're voting for, but they know which party they want to vote for. It is a myth that Americans ever had this moment when they deeply studied the individuals and the policy positions that individuals took. It's more that they studied and thought about the party, what the party represented, and what part of their views overlapped with that. What most political scientists have told us is that people don't satisfy in building the party that perfectly matches their views. They satisfy, they find parties that align with enough of their views that they believe that that party is the party they will trust in the next coming election. This point is really a long way of getting at a deeper point about American history that I think we have to take into account when we look at our world today, which is that political change in American society is very slow and it is very rare in a major form. Our party allegiances have historically been very, very sticky. If you look to the 19th century, you can predict people's voting almost perfectly by where they live, and who their parents are. And that's still largely true in much of the United States. Our partisanship is strong as a society historically, and our party affiliations 
are sticky and deep. They are sticky and deep. We tend to vote the same way. And throughout the 19th century, American society was structured around very close elections. The elections after the Civil War through the early 20th century are elections that bat back and forth between the Republican and the Democratic Party, with the Republican Party doing better most of the time. Uh, and they're very, they're very small differences that decide elections. Um, the experience many of us grew up with, with large electoral victories time and again for one party or the other uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, those, were, those were exceptional periods. In fact, closely fought elections are the norm, closely dividing the country by party. And that's actually what provides a certain level of stability within American society, because even the party that wins at the national level often doesn't win at the federal, at the state level, at the city level. The party that wins in the executive office, the White House, often doesn't win both houses of Congress. And of course, you have the lag in appointments to justice, uh, to, to court positions and things of that sort. So we were very slow moving partisan, sticky society. I make this point because the image and the rhetoric we use is just the opposite. We talk about ourselves as if we're a society that historically quickly moves places. In fact, our mobility is a lot less than we think it is. And right now we're a less mobile society than many of our peers. We talk about political changes if it happens overnight and we obsess over the personality of candidates. Uh, how could we not today, right? How could we not obsess? How can we not be deeply frustrated by the personality of candidates, but nonetheless, uh, it doesn't appear that that's actually what drives historically the way that change happens. At very rare moments in American history, and now I'm going to bring us from the history of the past to the current history that we're living in, at very rare moments, these partisan alignments break up. We call this, as historians and political scientists, we call these realignments. People use that phrase in the journalistic world, but they overuse it. There have been very few true realignments in American history. Very few times when sticky partisan identifications shifted for large numbers of people, when large numbers of Democrats became Republicans or when large numbers of Republicans became Democrats. Very, very rare that that occurs. You can have small movements, as happened in the 1970s, with certain working class Democrats becoming Republicans voting for Nixon and Reagan. You can have shifts that occur because the parties that flipped on the issue of civil rights, as happens between the Democratic and Republican parties in the 1950s. But when you are actually getting people changing their partisan point of view and the substance of what they identify with that, going from being free traders to protectionists, going from being gun rights people to non-gun rights, going from being defenders of Jim Crow to defenders and proponents of civil rights, those switches in large number are very, very rare. The three that are often pointed to most often in our society are of course the Civil War, 1893, and the elections that follow, following what was in fact a Great Depression of the late 19th century, the failure of the major railroad companies in the United States, the failure of the stock market, a Great Depression that was almost on the scale of the third realignment, which was the realignment that happened after the 1929 stock market crash during the Great Depression of the early 1930s. In 1860, you had the emergence of a new party, the Republican Party, that captured Whig votes, know-nothing votes, and some Northern Democratic votes, creating a new cleavage, realigning American politics. After 1893, you had the collapse of the Northern Democratic Party, the party of President Grover Cleveland, which had allied itself with Southern Confe former Confederate Democrats. That party's collapse created the dominance for a new post-1893 Republican Industrialist Party, the party of William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, the party of progressives, the party that in many ways was also the party of Bob La Follette uh, in, in Wisconsin. And then in 1929, 1930, and with the 1932 election, you had large numbers of Republicans who voted for Herbert Hoover, not only voting against Hoover, but now actually reaffiliating with the Democratic Party, going from being free marketers, laissez-faire uh, opponents of government intervention and social welfare programs, to now embracing the social welfare ideology, the tone, the rhetoric, the hope of Franklin Roosevelt's Democratic Party, and also going from isolationism 
of the late 1920s to a more internationalist viewpoint hinged upon the belief that the United States not only had to fight fascist powers, but had to build a world system that would provide for smooth economic growth so another depression would not happen again. I always remind my students that those who came out of the Great Depression and World War II era, when they said never again, they did not just mean no Holocaust and no World War II, they really meant no Great Depression. And to the end of her life, my 100-year-old grandmother passed away of almost 101. Uh, she was still a child of the Depression. If you live through the Depression, you saved every nickel. If you live through the Depression, you always believed it could happen again. You always believed. You were, it was seared into you, and it was seared into your partisan identifications. These moments of realignment are rare. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in one now. We have entered what I am calling the fourth great realignment since the Civil War. And this fourth great realignment is happening before our eyes for four reasons that I wanna sketch out and I hope we can talk about in the Q&A. First, this great realignment is happening because the party in power is abjectly failing to do what it's promised to do. A party that promised economic growth, a party that promised enhanced national security, a party that, that promised to drain the swamp, or in less belligerent terms, promised to reform government and make our society more efficient, and a party that above all promised to keep Americans safe. That's what people said about the Republican Party, right? They kept us safe. It is not doing those things. And they have been perhaps unlucky Republican leaders. They have perhaps made poor policy choices. Perhaps they don't have the most competent people in positions. We can argue over why that is. But the historical record is obvious. When hundreds of thousands of Americans are dying, when our economy is being closed down, when we are not able to test enough Americans, and when we are doing worse than our peers, it is not a partisan statement to say that those in power are not fulfilling what they promised would be their program of success. Just as in 1893, the Northern Democratic Party, which had captured the federal government under President Grover Cleveland, was not fulfilling. Just as the Herbert Hoover Republican Party that dominated the American government, Herbert Hoover won a huge victory in 1928, just as he was not able to address the depression. It's not just economics, it is the reality of failure. And those moments of abject failure, which thankfully are rare in American society, are moments of realignment. That's reason number one. Reason number two is because we're experiencing a historical demographic change. Uh, we have a very, very large generation, a large group, larger now than baby boomers, almost larger than baby boomers and pre-boomers combined, of millennials, and Gen Z's, of those born after the mid 1980s and up to 2016. Uh, those around Zachary's age and a bit older, many of my students, even some of my students from Madison, Wisconsin, are in this millennial position. And what's interesting about this group of millennials is how culturally different they are. They are much more comfortable with people of different uh, racial backgrounds and particularly people of different sexual preferences. Uh, they don't like to drive a lot. They have many other attributes. They have grown up in an electronic world. Uh, this does not make them better, but it makes their points of reference very, very different. Just think of it this way. Those who grew up before the internet and those who grew up with the internet grew up in different worlds. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but it changes the way they see things. Our politics until this moment have been dominated through the 1990s by the World War II generation, and since then by a generation of boomers, baby boomers, whose life experiences were so different, so different from them. Uh, and it explains, for example, why an issue like gay marriage uh, is not an issue now for the majority of voters. Third reason we're entering a realignment uh, right now uh, is because uh, of problems and evident mobilization around issues of race. Uh, racism is an old problem in American society. It's a complex problem. It is many, many lectures unto itself. 
Uh, and anyone who wants to talk seriously about race in American society should avoid simple statements. We are a society of incredible and enduring racism, but also incredible and enduring efforts to take ourselves out of that position, to embrace and liberate and empower different groups. Both have been the case. We have had repeated and coterminous civil rights and white supremacist movements as we have today throughout our history. The period after the Civil War was a period of liberation for African-Americans, but also a period of re-enslavement in many ways through the plantation system and many other mechanisms. So it is not that race is a new problem nor a simple problem, but here's what's changed. There has been an awakening and a new consciousness of this issue, in part motivated by technology, in part motivated by the fact that people have had time to focus upon this as their home. But most of all, most of all, because there has been now more and more mobilization by young people who see this as an important issue, important because it affects them in their daily lives. As we become a more diverse society and a younger society, which we have become, we have become a more racially conscious society. The Black Lives Matter movement, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, has now become probably one of the largest, if not the largest social movement in American history. If you count the number of people who have gone to protest and identified with it, and the number of people who have participated in activities connected to the aims of the Black Lives Matter movement. And just think, three months ago, it was unthinkable that a state like Mississippi would take the Confederate emblem out of its flag, or that people would embrace the idea in large numbers that people can st kneel, not stand, during the national anthem. Again, regardless of what you, what you believe, opinion has shifted. It has shifted because of racial consciousness around these issues. That doesn't provide us a clear pathway for a solution to our problems, but it makes that issue most central. One of the most important things about politics is not what you believe, but which issues you're willing to put your body, your money, and your voice behind. And race has become one of those issues. And then there's a fourth, and I think actually really the most important reason uh, why we're entering a uh, political realignment as a society right now. We're entering a political realignment because it is evident that we are living with institutions at all levels that are, are institutions of past success that don't match the world we're in right now. I think about that at universities. I think about that in our political system. I think about that in the way we vote. I think about that even in the way that we distribute basic goods within our society. You know, the country of Germany, when they wanted to provide assistance to citizens, they were able to put that directly into people's bank accounts. In our country, uh, millions of dead people received checks and millions of people who needed to receive checks didn't. We couldn't even distribute basic money to people that was provided for them as emergency aid during the early part of the COVID crisis. That's not an ideological issue, ladies and gentlemen. It's not because we have too much government or too little government. It's because we built institutions that worked well, reasonably well in their time. Many of them were New Deal institutions. Those institutions worked well, and because they worked well, they developed strong constituencies to continue working the way they worked. We have not adjusted our institutions. We're in a period of major institutional reform, from universities to local government to national government to everything that we do. And that, again, is not a partisan issue. There are different partisan positions, but that's the reality of the world we're in today. All of those things could be said in different ways about the realignment of the 1930s, about the realignment of the 1890s, and about the realignment of the 1860s. We're in the realignment of 2020 right now. And what I want to spend the last few minutes about on then is taking this history and looking forward from it. What does it tell us? What can we do? And I don't want to speak to us as Republicans or Democrats. What can we do as citizens who care? who see this as an opportunity, who see this as an opportunity. What have we learned from these other realignments? We have not learned that during a period of realignment, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, great people of integrity, spotless credentials and perfect ideas emerge. That's not what happens. We're gonna make more mistakes. We always do. But what is going to make this moment of realignment promising is if we are willing to experiment with doing new things. Much of the last 20 years has been a 20, 20 years just like before each other realignment of tearing things down, denying that we can do things, saying we shouldn't do one thing or another. Now we're entering in a realignment period 
a time when things that were off the table can be on the table again. We have, it seems to me, three old problems among many others in our society that would benefit, not from a particular political point of view, not from a particular ideology, but from serious work by new political leaders elected in a realigning election to actually reconsider. One is our healthcare system. I'm not an expert on healthcare, but our healthcare system is more expensive than most others and delivers poorer results. And uh, just look at the COVID crisis and you see that today. And it is horrible that our system is built around, the, around you're having to work. And so if you lose your job because of a recession triggered by COVID, you then lose your insurance. Uh, that is not a rational way to run a system. It made sense after World War II. It does not make sense today. Second is true of our economy. Our economy remains one of the most innovative in the world, but it's not as innovative as it's been. And it's an economy of grave inequalities. Uh, inequality has always been an issue in American societies. One can argue it's an engine of capitalism, perhaps. Uh, but the inequalities we confront today have created political resentments on both sides of the aisle. It's time to rethink our economy. Every realignment led to a rethinking of economy. And third and most important of all, who should lead? Who should lead? Uh, I live now in a state where I can safely say that the 300 undergrads I would, I would have in a lecture hall or I now have on Zoom uh, are better, far better than the people who serve in the state legislature and I would change them overnight if I could. I think the same might be true for Wisconsin. Why are we electing people like this? How have we allowed gerrymandering and money to move us in this direction? How can we rethink that? What realigning elections do and what is going to happen in coming years is a whole new crop of people are going to be elected to office and they are going to be united in their commitment to change and address the failures of the past, not just to talk about change, but to try new things, to keep us healthier, to deal with inequality, to address the failures of leadership, to provide leadership that can inspire rather than leadership that we're disgusted by and we have to turn off the phone and not tweet, not tweet again ever because it's so horrible. This is a moment, as in prior realignments, when you're not necessarily going to get Abraham Lincolns everywhere, but you're going to get the energy to actually try new things. What should all of us be doing? Ladies and gentlemen, our historical role is not to try ourselves to find the perfect solution or to argue down those we don't like. Our goal should be to support the people who we think are best qualified to address these issues, to abandon in our realignment as the pressures are forcing us, our partisan preferences, our personal likes and dislikes, and instead to embrace those who we think are most qualified, most capable, most willing. And my argument is that most of them will be young, most of them will be new, and most of them will be people who look different from those who came before. What realignments do is they change the leadership, which changes the policy and the parties, and new parties form. They might still have the same name. The Democratic Party, if you're a Democrat, should not look anything like it does today, five years from now. The Republican Party, if you're a Republican, should not look anything like it does today. There will still be two parties. They are likely to have the same names that they must be very different. We need to be part of that. If you are contributing to and supporting the old party, you're on the wrong side, the wrong side of history. You've got to support the new vision for your party, a new constructive vision. And I think that's where America is going. And I look forward to our discussing what that realignment and new partisanship, because it will be a new partisanship, can mean in a state like Wisconsin, a state like Texas, two states going through this right now, and in our country as a whole. Final point, returning to Zachary's poetry, he's sitting very uh, politely here listening to me, hoping I'll finish soon. Uh, final point, uh, going back to Zachary's poetry, this is about feeling. This is about feeling. It's not simply about trying to rationalize what we do. 
It's about feeling what it means to be a society that's connected, a society that's going through a wave of difficult transformation. And instead of resisting or denying, or looking for simple solutions, feeling our way forward through new alignments, new groupings that will become enduring in their own way. That's the genius of American society. It's not getting it right soon. It's not avoiding tragedy. It's getting it right eventually. Uh, Winston Churchill, it's always good to close on Winston Churchill, right? Uh, said, leave it to Americans to always do the right thing, or I'd say maybe leave it to Americans to always find some way out of their difficulties after doing all the wrong things first. Boy, are we living that today. Thank you for listening to me. Well, thank you for the presentation, Professor Suri, and thanks for everyone who attended today's meeting. For those who would like to listen in or have a question for Professor Suri, you can now join the Zoom Q&A meeting. And the link was provided in this morning's email from the Rotary office. We are adjourned.